Uh, would you please stand? We're going to start right with our music. Today is the day. Let's sing it out. Oh, oh, oh. I want to 
I want to see you To see you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory Pour out your power and love As we sing holy, holy, holy To see you high and lifted up Shining in the light of your glory transition into our next song let it be our prayer that we want to be better christians that we want to have more tender hearts more compassionate more holy so let us sing this one let it be our anthem today Help us to store good things in our hearts so that we may overflow with goodness. Purify us and make us sincerely better Christians, more loving, more compassionate, and more gentle in our speech and actions. We can't do it without you, Lord. 
Help us to please and honor you with every decision we make. Give us your strength to be the best Christians we can be. Amen. Would you please be seated? Yes, we have a few announcements. First of all, welcome. If you're a first-time guest, big welcome to you. Thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you've chosen Bay Point, and we want you to hang out with us after this service. We're having a brunch going on. You're welcome to come to that. We'd love to have you. So thank you again for coming. Um, our next announcement is it's World Communion Sunday today. So we're going to have fun uh, taking communion today. It's a special day. We have Upward Sports this Thursday. We have a ton of signups online. It's going to be crazy awesome, and we have lots of volunteers too. We've just grown every single season, and it's awesome to see that growth and um, just increase in the community. So if you're interested in that and sending your kids up, it's not too late. You can pre-register online or register the day of this Thursday at 530. So who's excited for that? Woo! If you want to, if you want to come out and watch and see how many kids there are, that's going to be so fun and entertaining to see them playing soccer. Um, the next announcement we have is Youth Night. We have an awesome youth band, youth challenge, October 17th at 6 p.m. here. It's going to be outside. So if you know any kids that like to play music and would enjoy this, tell them about it. We also have our Wednesday night youth activities going on. So see Kathy or Doug, 6 p.m. and don't forget Operation Christmas Child. I know we're just starting October here, but <laughs> the collection date is the third week of November, so we want you to have time to fill up as many boxes as you would like. There's some in the back, and we're gonna have a bunch next week, so we just, we just got more orders in, so please take a box, and if not, grab one in the middle of the week, come by, because we just got some more. And our last announcement is social media. How many of you are on social media? <laughs> I just counted last night. I was like, how many likes do we have on Facebook? And we have over 300, which is pretty good. But I'm ready for 400. Are you? <laughs> Are you ready for 400 likes? And, you know, if we're, the more that we're into the social media, the more that it spikes up on other people's. So we just want to increase that, get our name out there, right? Yes. Awesome. All right. At this time, it is greet time and children's dismissal. So let's go. <laughs> Speaking of social media, you've seen my Vision Works uh, videos, uh, updates, devotions. If you haven't, check it out. I'm going to be posting a new one later today, so every couple of weeks. Um, but uh, actually, this one's going to be on tithing, right? So very appropriate for uh, what we're about to enter into um, from an offertory standpoint. So um, Dave, can you get the scripture up there? We're working on it. <clears throat> if you haven't already placed your offering, uh, we've got an opportunity here, one in the back. Um, but uh, please go ahead and bow your heads. Dear Lord, help us to bring everything to you, our time, our talents, and our treasures. Not just today, not just in this time, but every single minute, every single day. You are just waiting to bless us. But everything you've blessed us with is yours. So help us to, to return that thanks, return that gratitude, and then figure out ways to bless others with the blessings that you bestow upon us. Dear Lord, help us to really focus on you in this time. All this we ask in your name. Amen. Quiet the voice of doubt again Echo within me every promise Let your words be louder than my fears Speak to the void when I can't see Lift up my head in every valley Let your joy be greater than my grief and I have set my heart, set my, set my heart on you. You have every part of me. I set my heart. 
Lord, on you. You make a way when none is found. You tell the roaring oceans to bow. I believe you're moving even now, right here, right now. Hey, and I have sent my heart, sent my, sent my heart on you. You have every part of me. I sent my heart on. Good morning, everyone. Late breaking announcement. God is good. All the time, isn't he? Isn't God good all the time? Amen. So it's our privilege to come in here and thank him for his goodness and his steadfast love. I can't reiterate enough. I know you guys think the devil is all in the social media, don't you? You think it's the Antichrist, don't you? But listen, churches are really using social media to reach people for Jesus Christ. It's so exciting. And I know that when we post stuff there, if indeed our wonderful, glorious, amazingly technologically advanced congregation like yourself, because you're on Twitter and, and Facebook and Instagram and those things, when you hit likes, our profile builds and it grows. And then we're able to reach more people. Now, I put on funny, funny videos. You'll just love them. You'll just love them all the time. I know John's doing a great job with the vision works on our website. Ethan is even uh, doing hilarious videos. If you want to get to know uh, Ethan, uh, jump on one of those things right now. But see it as a ministry, you know? See it as a way to reach people that otherwise we're not going to reach in a physical plant, in a physical campus. So keep that in mind. One thing the church always has to do is to improve itself, its outreach meth methods. How many know the message never changes, right? But the methods always, always do. And uh, we're trying to reach people who we may never, ever see with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want to just say, everybody this week, if you're not on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, make that your mission this week. Amen? Tell me you'll do it. Go ahead and lie to me a little bit. Okay, I'm going to hold you accountable next week. So we praise God and we want to thank Him. We do want to pray. Spend a moment in prayer here, very importantly. Um, we do want to uh, pray for our, our good friend, um, uh, Terry, who had a heart surgery a couple of weeks ago. He's recovering nicely. Uh, Terry Roderick. Let's remember uh, Jan and him in our prayers. Also, we want to pray for our president, who uh, recently contracted the COVID virus, the um, pray that he uh, gets stronger so he can uh, continue to lead our nation. Um, we just want to pray that um, this thing would go away, this plague, this curse, whatever you want to call it, uh, would just go away. And I thank God for your safety. I really do. I pray every week for our congregation that we may not uh, come in contact with that by using, you know, the mask when you're in dense pu uh, public uh, places. And also the social distancing, those rules still apply, uh, even though we are optimistic and confident that God will get us through it. Amen? There is a light at the end of the tunnel, right? Come on, turn that frown upside down out there. 
All right, we are going to get through it through God's grace and God's uh, uh, power and uh, God's strength. Amen. So will you bow your heads and hearts with me? Good and gracious God, we are glad to be in your house. When they said, let us go up to the house of the Lord, we said, amen. It is our privilege. It is our prerogative. It is our benefit to come together with our brothers and sisters um, on the Lord's day to proclaim the excellencies of your name, to thank you. Thank you so much for the ways you have protected us and the ways you have provided for us and the ways that you have sustained us in your grace and the ways that you have delivered unto us that salvation that has been entrusted to the saints and handed down and passed down from generation to generation. I thank you for each and every saint that has gone before. I thank you for each and every saint that is right here, right now. And I thank you for the future saints, which we have the ability to minister to even right now as they become stronger and stronger in the faith to not only know it and be transformed by it, but also to spread it because we know, Lord, this world needs you. This world needs you bad. This world needs you to take hearts of hate and turn them into hearts of love. This world needs you to do away with the divisiveness and the tension and the disunity, especially as we see in our world today, and get us unified in you again. Get us one, um, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. We need you, Lord. We cry out. We stand in the gap, as you told us to do, to take up the hedge so that the devourer will not come and devour our nation or devour our families or devour our souls. We need you, Lord, to come. Come in magnificent ways, creative ways, energetic ways, loving ways, in ways that we've never expected. We do lift up as we are admonished and encouraged in the Bible to constantly pray for our uh, political leaders, our national leaders, and we do that. We lift up President Trump and his family right now and pray that they might have a speedy recovery from this virus. God, we lift up our own uh, members and friends of our congregation who are suffering from other maladies. We pray for quick and speedy recoveries. And we pray, God, for our mission, like we are supposed to always do. Our mission to get and make disciples that transform the world. God, we, we lift that up to you. Just galvanize us today by seeing the sheer need of people who are lost and without hope, that only have themselves, that only have other people, and they don't have you. And therefore, they're getting depressed. They are using drugs. They are trying to develop unhealthy coping mechanisms, whether it's materialism or um, illicit things. Our hearts break when we see and sense and feel the lostness. And God, we just want to be your messengers. We just want to be a beacon of hope uh, for our communities, for our friends and families, for our nation. And so, God, keep working on us. Keep working through us. Keep doing things for us and then do things from us so that we indeed, we indeed can be all that we can be for you. And I pray this in the great name of Jesus. And we all said, <clears throat> amen. Guard your families. Guard your friends. Guard your investments. Guard your assets. Guard your spiritual, your physical, and your mental well-being. Guard everything that you know to guard. How many know, especially in this day, right? Now, in the Bible, we're told to guard things like the faith. And we're to guard things like the oppressed and those who are taken advantage of. That's the call of the church. The oppressed, the innocent, and the poor. We are called to guard, guard the things that we know that are righteous and good and holy. Guard them. Guard them. Be on your guard. 
Now, of all the things that we love that we are to guard and all the things that we are to protect because it's right to do so, there is one thing that we are to guard above everything else. And that one thing is our hearts. Our hearts. Because if we don't guard our hearts, we will be utterly incapable of guarding everything else. Utterly incapable of guarding the things that we love and the things that we cherish and the things that we know are righteous and holy and good. Guard your heart. We're going to start a new series today on this. And we're going to see why and how we are to guard our hearts above everything else that we are to guard. Our banner scripture for our series for the next few weeks is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Everybody read this for me because I want this to sink. I want this to saturate, okay? Everybody, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Guard your heart because it is the wellspring of life. The ancient book of Proverbs was written primarily by Solomon. Who remembers Solomon? Right? He was the oldest of David's sons, and he was the successor to his throne. Proverbs is known foremost as the manual of practical wisdom, or the manual of practical living. Now, as any good parent would, Solomon, the worldwide wisest, wise guy of all, wants to impart, wants to leave some advice um, to his son. Now, I would love to tell you who his son is here. We don't know because Solomon had over a hundred children. Imagine that. He's pretty prolific. Over a hundred kids. We don't know how many were boys and how many were girls. And we don't know which particular son that he was speaking to here. I'm assuming he was speaking to them all as he is speaking to us now. He wants to leave him or them some good counsel. How many know that's the role of a parent, right? How many know it's not the parent's responsibility to be a friend to their kids? Hello, right? Uh, to be a parent is to lead and to guide and to protect and to bless, right? And to beget and to bestow, right? To let our kids know what is right and wrong. I always tell, if you want to be a good parent, you got to teach your child the three R's. Do you know what they are? Respect, responsibility, and religion. How many know that our kids will do better if they have respect, responsibility, and religion, especially in this day and age? But beginning in chapter 4, verse 20, Solomon begins his counsel. My son, pay attention to what I say. Do you ever have to have that? said to your children, <laughs> hey, put the iPhone down, put the iPad down, turn the TV off. Uh, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight, meaning always remember them. Keep them within your Heart. Everybody do this right now. Within your heart. For they are life to those who find them in health. Health to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Now, we all know what it is to guard something, right? It's to kind of fend off attack, right? Attack. It is to protect it from hostile forces. How many know there's a lot of attacks upon your heart, right? And there's a lot of hostile forces out there. But why is Solomon telling his son to guard his heart, not just once in a while, you know, every once a month, guard your heart. Um, and of all the many things that we have to guard, throw your heart in there too, because that's important. No, top priority. For you and for me is to guard our hearts above everything else. Now, obviously, obviously, Solomon is not talking about our physical beaters, right? Right? He's not talking about our physical hearts. 
Although we really do need to guard them, don't we? From things like high cholesterol and uh, high blood pressure and arterial sclerosis, we know we have to guard them, right? But he is talking about our spiritual hearts, our spiritual hearts. Biblically speaking, the spiritual heart is the center of our emotions, our desires, our will, and our motivations. It is the center, actually, of our feelings. There are over 826 passages throughout the Old and the New Testament that speak about the spiritual heart of being who we are. Your heart determines. It determines the direction, the course of your life. The heart is the core. It's the heart of the matter, if you will. It's the uh, essence of your being and your doing. It is the source of the energy, the energy of who you are. Solomon calls it the wellspring of life. Think about things flowing out of you when he says that, okay? The wellspring of who you are. Now, I threw out a couple other uh, translations on this one because I think it's very interesting how this stuff is phrased. Uh, how many remember the King James Version? 1611, grew up on the King James. Memorized most of it, right? But listen to this. Keep thy, say thy with me. We never use that word anymore, do we? Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. English stand, uh, Standard Version. Keep your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. The New Living Translation. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. The message, Eugene Peterson. Keep Vigilant watch over your heart. That's where life starts. Wow. Did you know your heart was the center of who you are? The essence, the direction of your life. Now, I like to think of our hearts as being the engine or the motor of our lives. Regardless if you have a two-cylinder engine this morning, a four, a six, or a or an eight, who wants to hit on all cylinders, right? We all do, don't we, right? Now, we have to maintain our hearts even as we maintain the engine of our automobiles. How do we do that? Well, you know what? From time to time, we got to do things like change the oil, right? Or even the spark plugs. We got to tune it up. We got to change the belts out and things like that because we know, we know that we know that if we do not maintain our car engines well enough, well, they're going to break down and we're going to be stranded on the sides of the road. Much in the same way, we have to maintain our spiritual hearts. If we don't maintain them, our spiritual hearts will break down in life. And how many know that's a disaster? I love it. Old preacher Charles Swindoll used to say, whether you rust out or whether you burn out, it doesn't matter. You're out. And that's never, ever God's will for you, right? God wants our hearts to be filled with life and filled with passion and filled with joy and filled with love. And we get that if we guard our hearts. To put it simply, uh, and please get this, right? As your heart goes, so goes you. Let me do a quick survey, not in the notes. You didn't even have to put more in the offering plate. How's your heart this morning? Do you like where your heart's taking you right now? Do you like the feelings and the emotions that your heart is generating within you right now? How is your heart? Where is your heart taking you? Great question, huh? Now remember, Proverbs is a manual of practical wisdom or practical living. So how do we guard our hearts? We're called to guard our hearts above all other things. How do we do it? Well, 
Proverbs 4.27 gives us the very first step in how to guard our hearts. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Now, if I was Solomon here, I would probably say, you want to guard your heart? Man, make sure you go to church a lot. And let that crazy preacher up there tell you how to live. Right? Or if you want to guard your heart, here's what you got to do. You know, go ahead and pray a lot. And read your Bible a lot. Right? Right? You want to guard your heart? Well, those are some ways to do it, but it's fascinating here that the first thing that Solomon, remember the wisest of all the wise guys in the world at that time, says not to do something. How many of you know that's easier not to do something? Well, we'll see in a minute if it is easier, right? Okay, it's no accident that the first step in guarding our hearts is to put away all perversity and corrupt talk from our lips. Now, if we would translate that out today, you know how we would say it? Don't put your two cents in. How many like to put your two cents in? <laughs> it's an election year, right? We all want to put our two cents in. Okay, so we've got to be very careful if we're going to put our two cents in. Do not let your mouths deal with perversity or corrupt talk. Now, I like to call these things the verbal sins. Because I really do think that of all the, good, all the sins good Christians commit, most of them are verbal. They really are, right? Now, how many do you wish right now that our politicians would vote to keep perversity from their mouth and corrupt talk from their lips? Amen. amen? Can I get an amen on that? I don't care who you're voting for. It doesn't matter. But I think our politicians need to learn a lesson here from Proverbs 4.27. Now, how many wish good church folk would do likewise? Hello? Everybody say, oh me? Oh me, oh my, right? Now, we have a corollary text in Ephesians 4.29. The apostle Paul says this, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up. Well, if we could just stop right there and all go home, right? According to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now, of course, our mamas already gave us this piece of practical advice, didn't she? When she said, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. This means that pop singer Billy Joel was absolutely wrong in his famous song called Big Shot. It's no big sin to put your two cents in if you know when to leave it alone. Yes, it is. It usually is. Now, I could regale you with a, a dizzying array of scriptures where God himself is, gets really, really upset with his people when they commit verbal sins such as unwholesome talk, perverse mouths, and corrupt speech. Particularly when this, these verbal sins are designed to hurt the reputation of others or is based on presumption or lying, let alone how unfair and how demonic it all is. However, for today's purposes, I want to, I want to do a little diagnosis on you and on me today. What do these things, if we engage in them, do to our hearts? And how are we much better off with the course of our lives, with the center of our beings, our emotions, our passions, and everything that our hearts are, how are we much better off being a spiritual cardiologist 
How in the world does refraining from verbal sins such as these help our heart and guard them? Now, I want to have a little bit of a confession here this morning. Um, when I was a kid, my buddies and I, we loved to prank our neighbors, especially at Halloween, especially the neighbors we did not like. Generally, those were the neighbors that wouldn't let us play football out in their vast and open field, right? Those were the neighbors, if you rode by their house a little too quickly on your bicycle, they were sure to bark at you. Slow down there, youngster, you're going to hurt yourself, right? So generally, these were the curmudgeon types of neighbors who didn't like kids anywhere near them. Well, we would always store up strategies for these people especially at Halloween, right? And so one thing that we engaged in was this thing called sugar dumping. You ever hear of it? Sugar dumping. We would run around and pour sugar into their gasoline tanks. Pretty awesome, huh? <laughs> You better be, be aware if we, if we didn't like you, right? Now, this sugar wouldn't totally incapacitate the engine. It, it wouldn't. As much as it would just bog it down, because when the sugar got hotter, it would get sludgier, and it would primarily clog up the fuel lines and the fuel filters. It would get thick and gooey, and at some point would cause the engine to misfire or to skip, as uh, mechanics like to say. Now, we must say that this sludgy sugar uh, could easily be cleaned out with a fuel additive and with the installation of new fuel filters. And believe me, if our uh, roving gang of sugar dumpers would have understood that this is kind of serious for people, we probably would not have dumped sugar into gasoline tanks. But how many of you know that youth is wasted on the young, right? And boy, when my daddy found out we were doing that, there was absolute hell to pay. And, and there was, right? Now, much in the same way, putting our two cents in all of the time, in terms of these verbal sins I mentioned, is like pouring sugar into the gasoline tanks of our spiritual hearts. It bogs us down spiritually and emotionally speaking it's a direct injection or a deposit of negativity straight into our hearts now remember our hearts determine the outcourse of our lives and if we allow negative things into our hearts through negative or through negative talk then where are you going to end up in life? What is going to be the direction of your life if you allow this to happen? Jesus said as much in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Listen to this. The good person brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil person brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of what? His heart. The mouth speaks. Did you hear that again? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Boy. That's tough, isn't it? Because if we engage in these particular things, these verbal sins, this unwholesome talk, these perverse lips, we just think we're responding or reacting to the circumstances of the people around us. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, it's in your heart. It's in your heart. 
And we have allowed those things to come into our hearts because we did not guard them. We did not guard them. We did not repel the sugar dumping of verbal sins into our hearts. Now, I know this is extremely hard for good Americans, right? What do we have? What's our First Amendment, right? Freedom of speech, right? But how do we guard our hearts here? It's kind of interesting, right? When Jesus came, one of his priorities was to clean up our language. Did you know that, folks? Everybody say, yeah, I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> I just got to listen a little more closely to it, right? To clean up our speech, particularly about God. We know that in the model prayer, right? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, sanctified. Amazing. Holy is your name. Start there. Start by speaking well of God. And you'll see heart transformation start to happen. When we speak well of God, we're able then to speak well of other people. You see how it works, right? Jesus said we are to store good things in our hearts so that good things come out of our hearts. Amen? So what's the best way to do it? The most practical way to do that is to start speaking well about other people. Even people you don't agree with. Even people you don't like. Even people that, you know what, you wouldn't spend three seconds with them if you didn't happen. You see, if you transform your talking about God and about other people, you'll start transforming your heart. You'll be making direct, direct deposits of good things in your heart so that good things can come out of your hearts. Now, as we close today, you know, I think if we admit it, many of us still have the sugary sludge of negative talk in our hearts. It's just way too easy in our culture to engage in this. It just oozes out. Some people talk so negatively for so long, they don't even know they're being negative. Because they think they're right. And they don't even know how they're being controlled, mostly by anger. Is that you this morning? Because God wants to set you free today, if it is. Is that you this morning? Um, try a little spiritual exercise. How many of you believe you're pretty brave and courageous? Put your hand up. <laughs> yeah. You won't after this, all right? You ready? Okay. Try a little spiritual exercise. Find somebody that really, um, you know, likes you a little bit, <laughs> loves you a little bit, and go to them and say this. Sometime during the course of this week, without me knowing it, take your iPhone out and record one of our conversations. Hello? You don't get too many amens on this, do, do we? All right? Okay, now I had this happen to me about four years ago. And it happened to me right in the middle of a road rage rant. Whew. Wow. And after I calmed down, I assure you there was no cussing or swearing or, or anything like that, but man, I'll tell you what. I was livid of a big white truck that, that cut me off and when I was in a hurry. But when I listened to that recording, oh my goodness, I was so ashamed that I was speaking like that. Again, it wasn't the cussing and all that. It was just the rage. And right after that, I went, I got an exorcism and an enema to take care of it. I was, I was so abashed. And I said, you know what? I am never, 
ever going to speak like that again with those kinds of tones and that kind of energy and that kind of passion, wishing that guy would drive off a cliff. I just promised myself I wouldn't do that. And I remembered. Now, if you guys don't like the Bible, don't read Philippians 3.20, all right? Because Paul says there, our conversations are recorded in heaven. Did you hear that? Whoa. Jesus said every word we ever speak is recorded in heaven. There's already someone that's recording our conversations on their heavenly iPhone. And it is Jesus. And if we don't get this straightened up, we are going to hear those conversations in the future. Everybody say, yay! Oh, I can't wait for that. Right? Now there's forgiveness and all that, but we have to repent and we have to vow to transform our ways and we won't have to hear about it in the future. But it's true that if we clean up our speech, we will clean up our hearts. And if we clean up our hearts, we will clean up our speech because they work hand in hand. It's probably the only simultaneous transformation that we see in the scriptures. So if it's easy for you to put your two cents in, and your two cents in are generally, life sucks, everybody's terrible, I don't like anything, I don't like anybody, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, ask somebody, ask somebody to tape you, to record you. And then get alone with God and just say, Lord, 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 clean up my heart. Before we go to Holy Communion, I want you to pray with me the very simple, clean heart prayer of David. If our hearts are clean, our speech will be clean. Our talking will be clean. Negativity will be gone. Amen? You see how that works? So everybody pray this with me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Let's pray one more time. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And we do it, most of all, to guard our hearts. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we, we come before you now, and we know this is quite challenging. And Lord, especially in the season of our country, well, we're just seeing all kind of hearts that are filled with negativity and filled with gossip. And God, even for Christians, Christ followers, engaging in some pretty nasty talk, it's terrible. It's horrible. It's not who we are. But we must guard our hearts against unwholesome talk and perverse lips. We need this greatest transformation to happen in us so that we can truly be salt of the earth, a city set on the hill in the light of the world, shooting out gospel positivity, gospel love, gospel joy, in the midst of this dark generation. So you touch our hearts. As we sang earlier, will you purify them? Will you make them holy? Because we know our hearts set the direction and the course of our lives. And we just want to be your kids, pleasing you and blessing you not only by what we do, but also what we say. Lord, as we prepare for Holy Communion, we do, in fact, pray that you would give us a clean heart, O oh God, and put within us a willing spirit to get a clean heart. 
And that's what you do best. When we participate in the amazing elements of the bread and of the wine, you send forth your spirit to do spiritual work that we cannot do without the sacrament of Holy Communion. So I pray that as we bless and as we partake and, and as we bow to you, our undying fealty, that we will open our hearts up to you and you do what you do best. Do your spiritual surgery as our spiritual cardiologist. Do your surgery wherever it needs to be done. Will you bless the elements today as well? Bless the bread. This is the body of Jesus Christ, which is given for us, given for our salvation, given for our reconciliation back to God. You are our salvation through your given body on the cross for us. And Lord God, as we participate in the wine, we know that you allowed your blood to be shed for the remission of all of our sins, even the verbal ones. Whatever our sins are, they no longer have capacity over us. They no longer have dominion or power over us. When you allowed your blood to be shed, you broke the power of sin. Not only in the world, but in our hearts. And so we partake with thanks. We partake with infinite gratitude and thanksgiving for the splendid way that you have saved us and that you have transformed us. We give you thanks. This is the Eucharistic. This is the cup of blessing. And so right now, congregation, just in the silence of your own hearts, thank the Lord for his sacrifice on the cross for you today. So we bless you today, O Lord God even as we join hands and hearts with roughly 2.5 billion Christians the world over who are also celebrating this holy sacrament of communion. Will you not only bless us, will you bless them and the millions upon millions of churches that bear your name and the billions of people who follow you. Send forth your spirit and recreate us all into the image of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gospel, the gospel, not just for America, the gospel for the entire world, for people of all nations, tribes, kindreds, and tongues are blessing you and praising you on this momentous and holy morning for who you are, and for what you have done for us. We join our voices and we join our hearts with them on World Communion Sunday, thanking you that we don't do this alone. We do it in solidarity with brothers and sisters in the faith the world over. Bolster our hearts and our spirits as we now participate in communion with them. In the name of Jesus, we all said, amen. Would you please stand, and we're going to sing our last song, Holiness. Here we go. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness, holiness. 
That was the bounciest version I've ever heard of that song. I like it. Um, if you want any special prayer, if you have a special need for, uh, yourself or for a friend, we want to open the altar up uh, after the benediction. Come on down and receive a touch from the Lord. Uh, we'll be here praying for you. We also want to invite you to the Bay Point Brunch where we're learning how to read the Bible. We're getting good food for the body and good food for the soul. And uh, listen, you don't have to worry about beating the Baptist to the restaurants if you come on down. Uh, immediately following this. But here's our benediction. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Live in this scripture this week. God bless you and have a wonderful day.